but I'd like to start by just um, welcoming everybody who's here. I'm very excited that we're having this HAMSI workshop uh, still, even in the midst of uh, all of the challenges that we are facing right now. Uh, our participation is excellent right now. We have uh, 43 panelists and 95 attendees signed in right now, and I just think that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you everyone for joining in. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about how you can interact as an attendee. Uh, for the moment, what you can know is that um, you will be able to chat using a text chat window uh, to the moderators who will be able to uh, read your uh, chats, ask questions, interact with you, and um, it can even enable uh, talking for some people as well. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2020 HAMSI workshop. Uh, the Auroral Connection. So this workshop is today and tomorrow, Friday, March 20th through Saturday, March 21st, 2020. And it was originally supposed to be held in person at the University of Scranton, which is where I'm a professor. Um, this is the Loyola Science Center at the University of Scranton. Um, so hopefully we will be able to meet here next year. Uh, we will work on that. But for now, I'm very grateful that all of you have put in the effort to make this transition to an online workshop and meeting. And I'm very excited about our program for the next couple days. Now I'm gonna start with some slides that might be a little bit funny to some people, but might make some sense to a lot of other people. And that is, what is ham radio? And you might say, well, why are we saying what is ham radio at a ham radio conference? Because many of you have been involved in ham radio for years. But in fact, this is the ham sci workshop, the ham radio science citizen investigation. So many people here are already ham radio operators, but we have some people who are joining us from the science community and are less familiar with ham radio. And we can also have some people who are coming in and watching this from other fields who this might be their first exposure to ham radio, or they may have just heard about it. So I think it's worthwhile spending a few minutes to just say what ham radio is. So ham radio, this is a hobby for radio enthusiasts. It includes communicators, builders, and experimenters. All sorts of people, anyone who's interested in how radios work, interested in communication via wireless signals. Uh, we have a very wide reaching demographic. Uh, we have, it covers all ages and walks of life. Uh, there are over 760,000 ham radio operators in the United States and about three million worldwide. And what makes a ham radio operator? It does take a little bit more than just having an interest. You actually need to be licensed by your federal government. So what do you need to do to get licensed? There's an exam series. In the United States, there are three different exams you need to take in order to get your full amateur extra license. And these exams, they cover questions about basic radio frequency, electrical engineering knowledge, um, and the nice thing about these exams is they provide a path to learning and it ensures a basic interest and knowledge from a knowledge level from each participant. So Nathaniel, can I interrupt yeah. you? We sure. cannot see your slides. You did not share them. Oh my gosh. Thank you very much. No problem. Here we go. How's Can that's you better. See this? Okay, yeah, that's good. so yes, so here's the University of Scranton. There's Loyola Science Center. That's where we're all supposed to be meeting. Here is the uh, Hamster Workshop 2020, the overall connection. So yes, yeah, so what are ham radio operators? Um, they need to be licensed by their federal government. And this licensing process ensures some pathway to, uh, to knowledge. It's, a, it's actually an educational process, just getting your license. And each ham has a government issued call sign. So you will see that throughout this presentation. Um, so my call sign is Whiskey 2 November Alpha Foxtrot. Those are phonetics that stand for the letters W2NAF. So here we have um, the two Joshes from NGIT. They've got KD2JAO and WB2JSV. They're over here. We'll be hearing from Bill Engelke, AB4EJ later. That's his call sign. And there's his home ham radio station. And we'll also be hearing from John Ackerman later, uh, N8UR. He's interested in uh, constructing devices that have very precision uh, time measurement capabilities. So ham radio operates all ages, walks of life and interest, but brought together by the common interest of uh, radio engineering, uh, communication and experimentation. 
So here are some examples of ham radio communications. Uh, we cover emergency and public service. So if there is an emergency and communications break down, ham radio operators have the ability to set up in the field and uh, communicate over long distances without any uh, public infrastructure. So that's very important. Um, I've participated in other field operations through the scouting program. So here's the K2BSA Scout Jamboree uh, system. Uh, we will be hearing from the very well-known contester, uh, Tim Duffy, later today, K3LR. So here's his, uh, his station. Now what contesting is, this is where you're uh, really gamifying ham radio. You're saying, how many people can I talk to in a very short period of time and in how many different places. And what's really interesting from the science perspective is there's a lot of science that goes behind this. You need to, you can learn something from watching how the contesters behave and how their signals propagate. And uh, conversely, the contesters can help the ham radio operator, can help the scientists by providing a data source for the ham radio, for the scientists. There are his antennas. Uh, we have some participants all the way up in Alaska. This is an actual research station, but they also have a ham radio station up there. Uh, so sometimes we go to faraway places and ham radio operators like to talk to people in these faraway places. And um, that could include what we call DXing or talking to places, faraway places. Uh, DXing stands for distance. Now, on the other side of the field, so that gives us a little bit of an introduction to ham radio. On the other side of things, we have people who are space physicists, space scientists, and space weather people. And these people, maybe like me, I came into the field because I was interested in ham radio and space weather and space science affected my radio. But some of these people came into a different path. They were just interested in how the world works. Uh, what are the physics behind uh, the how the sun interacts with the earth, what are the physics of the atmosphere. And so some of these people, they may not have ham radio licenses, uh, but they may be very, they may have very strong expertise into how radio signals actually propagate or what, what affects these radio signals. So there are two main systems that are actually coupled together, but uh, for various for various reasons, we separate things into two different thoughts here. We have the geospace system, which includes the sun, the solar wind, uh, the Earth's magnetosphere, and then that connects down into the ionosphere. And so here with the geospace system, you get a lot of input from the sun and the solar wind, and that causes that effect how radio waves propagate on Earth. We also have, looking in the, in the atmosphere on Earth, we have the neutral atmosphere down here where there's no... Uh, electric charges, and that's connected with the ionosphere, which is electrified, and all of these things can also affect radio waves. So by looking at how the ham radio operators' radio signals travel through these layers, we can also remote sense or see the effects that the physics here has on this, and we try to understand what the physics is by looking at how, uh, how the radio waves are affected by these systems. So um, we'll be talking a lot about space weather, personal space weather station uh, in this particular meeting. So uh, hams, they often think about operations, ham radio operators, they often want to know what the best frequency is for operating DX or talking to that faraway station. They might want to understand the radio uh, frequency and interference environment. They might want to communicate better during emergencies. So often ham radio operators come at uh, things more from an engineering type of perspective. How do we make this thing work? Whereas on the research side, the scientists, they often want to better sample the environment, better understand the near earth space environment. And that's a really key thing. Scientists are very interested in just understanding how the physical environment works. Um, and then the space weather people often take that back and try to apply it back to operations. Uh, I should note that we currently have a fairly good understanding of space climate, how things behave in a long term. So we understand something about the 11-year sunspot cycle. You can call it the 11-year cycle or the 22-year cycle, but we understand something about that. And we can understand how there's day and night variations, which I'll talk about a little bit. But we don't necessarily understand space weather very well. How do things change on a short-term scale? What is the variability from this? And this is where a lot of the research is right now. Um, how do we go from just this understanding of space climate to space weather? 
so the ham radio sciences investigation or ham sci tries to bring these two groups of people together, the ham radio operators and the scientists together. So we're a collective that allows university researchers to collaborate with the amateur radio community in scientific investigations. And so we have three main objectives. One is to advance scientific and research and understanding through amateur radio activities. And you'll hear lots of presentations about that to, on, in this workshop. Two is to encourage the development of new technologies to support this research which we are doing with the personal space weather station and you'll see many presentations about that and then three is to provide educational opportunities for the amateur community and the general public and this is one of the main reasons why we're making this hamsai workshop so widely available in this webinar format is to provide those opportunities and, and meet this third objective so we're trying to meet all of these objectives here so this is our third HAMSI workshop, and it's really important to have a theme. And so the theme for this workshop is going to be the auroral connection. Now, why do we pick that? Well, there's a couple reasons. So one, um, if I jump back to this slide over here, you can see that these magnetic field lines all pile into the polar regions of the Earth. And, and, and that allows charged particles in space to flow easily along these magnetic field lines and end up precipitating into the upper atmosphere. And that causes very interesting dynamics if you look in what we call the auroral zone. And so this auroral zone is essentially a way of remote sensing into space. It also uh, provides very interesting propagation phenomena. So I've been very fortunate. I've been able to go down to McMurdo Station and help service some of the scientific equipment down there. And while I, was operate, while I was down there, I was able to operate their ham radio station, KC4USB. So here's a recording that I made while I was down there. able to hear that? Let me just reshare my screen here. Yes, no pro came through no problem. Okay, great. So what you heard was all sorts of variability in the signal. Let me play that one more time. And that I believe is caused by the aurora. So that's my side tone, it's nice and pure. Now listen to the variability here. So it's that sort of variability that we can see in our ham radio signals that's also of interest to the scientific community. And we'll be hearing quite a bit more about that tomorrow. The other reason we picked the auroral connection is um, there is another citizen science project called Aurorasaurus. So ham radio sciences and investigation is a citizen science project where we aim to advance science uh, by interacting with the community. Uh, and we do that through ham radio. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth McDonald from NASA, she founded Aurorasaurus a number of years ago, and she focuses on doing citizen science with the Aurora. And so by teaming up together, we're able to uh, investigate both the optical aspects and the radio aspects of the Aurora. And so this is where our theme comes in and where we're going to have our Saturday morning tutorials tomorrow. Liz will be talking about Aurorasaurus and the optical Aurora. Dr. Jim LaBelle from Dartmouth College, he'll be talking about auroral radio physics uh, and how you can observe uh, natural radio signals from the aurora. And then we'll have from, and so Liz and Jim, they represent the scientific side of things. And then Dave Hallady, K2DH, he's going to represent the amateur radio side of things. And he's going to talk about how you can actually use ham radio and the aurora to communicate. So that'll be tomorrow morning. Okay, this year we're virtual. So there's a few things that are different about this workshop than your typical HAMSI workshop that you might attend in person. So I want to cover a few things. So every session is going to have a session chair and that will be me for the oral talks and it will be uh, Laura Brandt uh, for the poster and demo session. So the session chair is a person responsible for introducing talks, controlling the flow of questions and keeping track of time. 
We also have assigned Zoom moderators. These are panelists who are assigned to monitor the Zoom chat window and interact with attendees. The presenter, of course, is the person giving the presentation. The panelists, this includes both presenters and invited participants. Presenters can share video, talk, and ask questions directly. So you'll be hearing when you see people's pictures on the screen, they're serving as panelists. Attendees are people who've signed up for this workshop through the uh, internet on the hamsi.org website, and they can watch and listen to the workshop, but they cannot directly talk or share video. You can, however, you should ask questions and make comments through the Zoom chat window. And the moderators will be watching that chat window and they can ask questions on your behalf. You can also raise your hand uh, to get the attention of a moderator. There's a button on the bottom of your video screen that says raise hand. And then if you do that, the moderator uh, should chat with you uh, via that window. Uh, we're also live streaming and video recording this. Uh, there is a live, a YouTube live stream account um, address that's posted on hamsi.org slash hamsi2020. You cannot chat in the YouTube stream. You need to log into Zoom for that, but this is an easy way to watch the workshop without having to have Zoom installed on your computer. And the meeting is also being recorded and it will be post-processed and edited by uh, Jason Johnston, KC5HWB of Ham Radio 2.0. So thank you very much, Jason, for uh, helping out with this. Okay, are there any questions right now? 